Well, I'm glad you all made it. We have real problems in our real world and challenges, don't we? Uh, sometimes there is, sometimes there are other things. And one of the things that I love about the scriptures is that the scriptures always talk about things that are real issues to real people. I think it's just wonderful that we can look at that today. And this incident in the gospel lesson is no different. Uh, if you remember, over the course of the last several weeks, we've been looking at texts which I've shared take place during the midst of Holy Week. Jesus has come into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Uh, the, the religious leaders have wanted to alienate and isolate him. They've wanted to find a way to discredit him. And so they've been asking him a series of questions. The questions, especially this one today, but the questions in general, have had one of three focal points. We want Jesus to make a mistake so that either the people will no longer like him. If we can turn the population against him, we've won. A second reason is maybe he'll say something so the Roman government will not like him. That's sort of the issue of the taxation today. And so if he says something against the emperor, then they can get him with treason. Or the third is maybe we can get him to say something that is blasphemous against God so that we can therefore do what we can do. The Jews had the right to stone somebody for blasphemy. We sometimes forget that. They could have stoned Jesus for blasphemy, but they wanted it to happen in such a way that the Romans would be at fault so they could be let off the hook. But that was the intention of their question, to turn one of those three things on Jesus so that Jesus could be done away with. We, he lived in a real world with real problems that were confronting him every day. So in the, our uh, text today, the topic is taxes. You're probably familiar with the text. <laughs> Not the first time that you've gone around with this particular text. Did you know that there were three taxes that the Romans made against the Jewish people, or upon the Jewish people? Remember, the Romans were an occupying force. The people of Israel did not like the Romans. We can see to some degree while we're in the nations of Iraq and Afghanistan, even though we feel like we're doing good things to help people and bring democracy and freedom to them, the local people in those particular nations do not necessarily like us. Not just the bad guys like the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and that type of thing, but the people in general. We are occupiers of their land, no matter how good our motivation and intent is. Such was the case with the Jews toward the Romans, and the Romans made three taxes on the people. William Barclay lays them out in this fashion in his commentary. Number one is what was called a ground tax. In the ground tax, people pay to the government one-tenth of the grain they raise and one-fifth of all the oil and wine they produce. Wow. So right off the top, and the soldiers made sure that that was collected. The second type of tax was the income tax. We know a little bit about that. Not very much here, but it's a big topic of debate at various levels of the state government. And that was 1% of a man's income. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? Wish we had that one. <laughs> that would be great. And then the third one was what was called the poll tax. And the poll tax was made by every male person between the ages of 14 and 65 and every female person from the ages of 12 to 65. Now, I couldn't find any reason why the women were begun to be the poll tax younger. My guess is that women at the age of 12 in that day and age often would be pledged to be married. So they could be bearing children, they were seen as adults in their community and within their families, and therefore it seemed to be fair game to tax them as an adult within that society. Interesting stuff. And for both the woman and for the man, a denarius was charged as the poll tax, which was a day's wage. And a denarius was one coin, which often had on it the face of Caesar with 
the emperor logo or description underneath that. The poll tax is the issue that was being raised by the religious leaders with Jesus. Now, interesting, it wasn't the Pharisees and Sadducees who came to Jesus. They sent their students, their underlings. They, I think they're trying to track Jesus by getting away from familiar faces. But it also says they came with the Herodians. Now, the Herodians and the religious leaders were in opposite from each other, politically, religiously, societally, but they were strange bedfellows as they came together to try to trap Jesus. That was the circumstance into which Jesus walked on this particular occasion. Do we know anything about taxes in America? Mm. With all the other stuff going on, the tax uh, debate between the two parties is not mentioned, which I have a little clipping of a photograph from a business journal which says this is what taxes would be under the Republicans, this is what taxes would be under the Democrats. Very interesting debate, but we know a little bit about taxes. We are coming up into stewardship season. I found this story of taxes to be very interesting. An IRS agent dropped by the church to talk to the pastor. Upon entering the pastor's office, he said, Reverend, do you have a John Smith as a member of your congregation? The pastor said, yes, we do. And then the IRS agent said, did Mr. Smith contribute $100,000 to, to your congregation last year? And the pastor responded by saying, yes, he will. <laughs> We laugh about it, don't we? Now, I don't know if you've done this with your son or not, but at 11, he may be in the mood for this. A young man went to his dad and said, Dad, I keep hearing all this stuff about taxes. What are taxes? Dad didn't say much. But that night after dinner, Dad went to the refrigerator, the freezer, pulled out a thing of ice cream, his son's favorite ice cream, and he took a big scoop and he scooped up a huge bowl of ice cream, stuck a spoon in it, and went over and gave it to his son. His son was smiling and picked up the spoon, but before his son could take one bite, dad, dad grabbed the bowl and took a third of the ice cream and put it into his own plate and pushed it back to his son. And his son began to cry. And, and the dad said, son, this morning you asked me what taxes were. That's what taxes are. <laughs> Pretty poignant, isn't it? We know today in America that taxes, most working people will work all of January, all of February, all of March, all of April, and well into May to pay their taxes for the year before they earn anything for themselves. Taxes are a big issue. And you can imagine if that's our emotional response to taxes today, what was it like for the Jews because it came from Rome as well as from the religious leaders? And so Jesus responded to this trap, and they were simply trying to trap him to either turn the crowd against him or to turn the people against him or the Romans against him. What do you do? And very wisely, Jesus said those words we remember today. Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and give to God that which is God's. Powerful words. Interestingly, it's fairly easy when it comes to our taxes, isn't it? Because most governments spell out, as did the Romans for the Jews, and our government does for us, here is what it costs. If you're in the 12% bracket, this is what it costs after deductions. At 50% bracket, this is what it's going to cost. We know what to expect, giving Caesar that which is Caesar's. But what in the heck does it mean to give to God that which is God's? I had a friend uh, from a few years back who uh, was in the Vietnam War. And he was drafted and he was drafted in the army, and he said, I do not, I have not been given by God the right to take another person's life. That's not something I can do. But my government has the right to draft me into military service. 
Therefore, I will enlist as a medic. And he spent four years in Vietnam as a medic. And he worked hard as a medic. And he felt called by God initially. He became a nurse. Then he became a physician. And over the course of time, he became the chief internist for the United States Army. He worked his way up. He stayed in the military throughout his entire career. That is how he tried to deal with the issue of give to God what is God's. It was a real struggle for him, and it shaped his entire life. But that's how he processed it. I believe when we, can, when we look at the book of 1 Thessalonians, we can see another image of what it means to give God that which is God's. Interestingly, many people believe that 1 Thessalonians is the first uh, book written in the New Testament. Did you know that? Uh, it was written about 50 A.D. in the springtime. Paul was in Corinth. He had just been uh, either six to nine months earlier in Thessalonica, and he had started the Christian church there. And people had responded to the good news of the gospel, and then the people in power got upset, and they created sort of a, a revolution in the streets, and they threatened to take Paul's life, and so they encouraged Paul to leave, which he did. But he had a real heart for these early Christians. And so during that time, he said, how can we continue to stay in touch? How can I support that young, infant Christian church and its leadership? And then have people shuttle back and forth between the, two con the congregation in Thessalonica and where the Apostle Paul was. They had asked questions, and it appears that Paul wrote them letters explaining certain things about what to believe about or about how to live. We don't have those records. But what we do have is the letter to the, the first letter to the Thessalonians. And in that, the Apostle Paul starts off with some wonderful statements. He does the normal greeting that was typical of every Roman letter to anybody at that particular time. And he says this very simply. He says, uh, to the church of Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. That phrase, grace to you and peace, was very common in the early church. And it was sort of like their aloha. Any of you ever been to Hawaii? You know, you get off the plane and they say, aloha. And they put the wreath around your neck and they welcome you. And then when you are leaving 10 days later with your suntan, they stand there and say, Aloha! Good riddance! Oh no, goodbye! Until next time! Aloha was the phrase of welcoming as well as saying goodbye. This is a very common way within many cultures. That was the way they did it. Grace and peace were the aloha of the early Christian church. And in that, that greeting, the peace was a summary of the Old Testament, the shalom of God. And what it meant is we wish you wholeness and fulfillment as God's people. And isn't that a wonderful phrase, a wonderful way of looking at it? It's not just peace from outside influences. It's not just peace from war. There are certain things that happen outside of us that we cannot control, and when we focus on that, we miss the point of the shalom of God, which is peace internally, which nothing can rob me from the outside. And so the Apostle Paul would often greet his congregations with shalom, peace, fulfillment, contentment from God. That's what the old covenant was about. And then grace was the word of the new covenant. The old covenant meant you tried to follow all the rules, and if you failed, you came up short, your peace was disrupted. But in the New Testament, because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins, something we did not deserve, God gave us grace. And that grace transforms our life. We have God's bounty at Christ's expense. And so in many of the letters, Paul took the Old Testament shalom and the New Testament grace and put them together in his greeting to the people of God. It is a wonderful thing. And then he started off by saying, I'm proud of you. I remember you. In fact, all of us in this community pray for you and remember you often. And three things stand out that for which we remember you. I believe these three things are a sign of what we give back to God. 
give unto God the things that are God's. First of all, your work of faith. All of us work in one shape or another. At one time or another, in one way or another. They worked in faith. Now, what does that mean? Well, I was thinking this morning about a situation I had in my first congregation. We got a new senior pastor, and the new senior pastor made it very evident, very quickly, that I was not his guy. I didn't meet his standard of success. He didn't like what I was doing. He was looking for somebody else. So anytime I saw him, he never smiled. He never really welcomed me. And when I finally came to him and said, you know, I'm thinking of activating my dossier, his response was, that might be a good idea. For a year and a half, that type of atmosphere existed. Now, that would have been very coloring and disappointing rejecting my work and it would have made it a burden to come to work every Sunday except I didn't work for him. Ultimately, my goal was not to focus on his liking me but upon God's liking me. And what the Apostle Paul affirms for these early Christians is that no matter what they did, where they did it, they did it in faith of the living God. They were living their lives for the audience of one, as Oz Guinness said in his book called The Call. We live our lives for the audience of one. We let God set the standard of what is success. And if I hear from the throne of heaven, well done, thou good and faithful servant, then I know I have done my work well. That's one thing we can give to God. Well, he's given us breath, he's given us life, we can give him everything we do. The second thing they did was they had a labor of love. Now, interestingly, in the Greek, the work and labor, which sometimes we have translated in the same way, were two very distinct things. Work was what you did every day, week in, week out. Labor of love is what we did with one another within the family of God, or when God moved us to be compassionate to another person. Any of you ever felt the desire uh, or signed up on the sheet anyway to take food to somebody in need? Yeah, I have to, we have to. Now, you can do that out of duty and obligation with a begrudging spirit. Or you can see that labor as an opportunity to love somebody with the love of God through Jesus Christ. The people of Thessalonians, Thessalonica, were known for having done that in such a way that the love of God came through the labor they had with one another. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Here we are, 1950 years later, talking about them. Wouldn't it be wonderful if a thousand years from now, people would say, you know those Christians in Polson, Montana. Do you know what they did? They cared for one another. They loved one another in such an incredible way that you could feel the labor of God's love in them and through them. That's another way we can give unto God that which is God's. And then the third way he mentions is the steadfastness of hope. Hope is an interesting thing, isn't it? I don't know about you, but these days in America, I think it's very easy to displace our hope. There are a lot of people who have placed their hope in the hands of either Donald J. Trump or Joseph Biden. And in 17 days, when the election results start coming in, they may be people in despair on one side or the other. While one side is cheering with success, the other side will be despairing because of loss. I propose to you that if that happens, you have placed your hope in the wrong place. You have. There are people who place their hope in the work they do and in the benefits that that brings to them as people. 
I gotta tell you, in this the last seven, eight months, if that's where your ultimate hope is, your lives can be shattered. I think of all the people in the restaurant industry who used to have uh, you know, full restaurants, and now it's 25%. And they're wondering if they can keep their employees or if they'll even be able to keep the restaurant. Now over 7,000 businesses in New York City alone have been closed. Where is your hope? These early Christians made a choice. And their choice was, I am going to place my hope not in my work, not in all the things that so many people around me do, but I'm going to base my hope and place my hope in God's love for me through Jesus Christ my Lord. And knowing that this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid out somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I won't feel at home in this world anymore because their hope is a different place. And one of the things we can give to God is our hope and making sure it's focused in the right place. So what about you? What work do you have to do and do you do that for God? What labor do you have as you minister to others in this difficult time? Can you do that with the love of God through Jesus Christ? And where is your hope? Give unto Caesar those things which are Caesar's, but give unto God those things that are God's. Let's pray. Oh Lord, the issues that were raised today are not new. They've been the same issues that people who have followed you, given their lives to you, have been forced to ask, and decisions have to be made throughout the eons. We've seen examples from the past, like those folks in 1 Thessalonians. Lord, we have to ask and make decisions for our lives today. And may the faith, hope, and love we live, and the faith, hope, and love we choose, become an offering to you that will become a sweet, sweet offering that people can experience and enjoy and give thanks for in years to come. We pray this, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, in conclusion, there's a wonderful song in page 430 in the hymn book. It's called, Come Sing, O Church in Joy. Um, I think you'll recognize the melody. You may have to focus in on the words. But let's stand and sing together. We'll sing, uh, Come Sing, O Church in Joy. And we will be singing all four verses. Uh, I will be doing the benediction afterwards. Since I'm playing guitar, I don't want to stop me. <laughs> it's a great song. Goes well, like this.
hope and love. Let's celebrate the journey through this life into God's presence and all along the way.